guest, Mr. Howie Mooney, is an actual media professional, folks. He is a, uh, a sports journalist. He, uh, in fact, uh, he, I'll read his Instagram uh, bio here. A dad, a guy, a former goalie, one of two hosts of the Sports Lunatic Sports History Podcasts, also a contributor to the Fired Up Network dot ca for canada website that's the toronto skyline behind mr mooney thank you sir for joining us today uh thank you for having me i really appreciate it absolutely you can see the man has his professional setup here um tell us a little bit uh walk us through kind of your media career your goalie uh life and and how that kind of dovetails with your appa and other sports simulation experience well my appa life kind of started a long time ago uh, 1972 or 73. Uh, it was in the winter. It might have been January of 73. Uh, we had our class had some kind of field trip, I think, or there was a snow day, one or the other. But our teacher knew that half the class wasn't going to be there. So he brought in his APA baseball game. And he had the 1960 season. And I fell in love with it right away. I just, I just, there was something about it. It just resonated with me. And I, I used my paper route money and I, I, I put it all together and I sent my, I got a money order, sent it away to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I bought the, uh, the baseball game for the 1972 season. And I've, I've been, I played it religiously until I got into college and discovered beer and girls and, uh, and kind of put it on the shelf for a while. But uh, uh, in terms of media, that kind of came about um, by, uh, uh, more of an organic uh, way, I think. Um, I, I had done a couple of Canadian sports history uh, calendars where I put an event on every day and they, they got sold across Canada. And from that, I started getting little, little bites here and there and ended up hosting a, a sports trivia show in Ottawa with my brother. And uh, then we, uh, you know, the kind of things kind of took off from there. I became the play-by-play uh, -play play and, and color commentator for uh, the Montreal Expos AAA team in Ottawa, the Ottawa Lynx. Uh, I covered the Ottawa Rough Riders of the Canadian Football League for a couple of years. I uh, hosted uh, Ottawa 67s games, which, which are a team in their team in the OHL, the Ontario Hockey League. And I also uh, covered the Ottawa Senators for four years. Uh, that was, that was a lot of fun uh, getting to I mean, I played hockey all my life. I, I was, a, as you say, I was a goalie and uh, you know, you, you kind of know your guys in your own rooms and stuff like that. But then when you get in with the, with the NHL guys and you're talking with them and you got a microphone in their face all the time, you know, after morning skates and after games, you realize that they're just guys like the guys that you play hockey with yourself, you know, and uh, uh, you know, some of the nicest people in the world. Uh, I was just talking with a friend of mine uh, earlier today and we were talking about how nice, uh, you know, the athletes are, he said, uh, we were talking about Claude Lemieux. Claude Lemieux is one of the most hated hockey players in history. And uh, he was telling a story about uh, a waiter in a restaurant. I think it was in Detroit, he said. And the guy wanted to hate Lemieux. But Lemieux was so nice. And he always requested a table in his section. So he couldn't hate him because because Lemieux was so nice. And, and I, I said to him, you know, a lot of the guys, the guys, the, the guys that fight are the nicest guys in the world. They're the guys that are the most, the most generous, the most wonderful guys, you know, and, and, and the, they have the most time for everybody. Uh, it, it's so funny. And I always found that uh, football players were the same way, especially guys in the CFL. Uh, they, they seem to just be so nice. I think it's because they get paid less. They, they're more regular, uh, more regular sensibilities, I guess, when it comes to, uh, to life in general. And, uh, you know, that's, how, that's kind of uh, what we were talking about with that. But yeah, when, in, in terms of being a goalie, I just always was a goalie from the time I was a kid until a few years ago when I had to stop playing because I had a hip replacement. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I can't I can't do it anymore. I asked the uh, I asked the uh, surgeon, I said, will I be able to play hockey afterwards? And he says, what position do you play? And I said, well, I'm a goalie. He says, no, mm -hmm. no, it'll put too much stress on the joint. And we had a pause in our conversation for a second. And I said, well, can I play piano? And he said he looked kind of puzzled as my question and I he says I don't see why not I said good because I could never play it before <laughs> boom there you go <laughs> the miracles of uh, orthopedics <laughs> yes exactly 
<laughs> so, so in terms of football and Canadian sports, is the uh, CFL, would you say it's got the level of popularity in Canada as the uh, NFL does in the U.S. these days? Uh, I think the NFL in, in, in the United States, I lived in Seattle for a couple of years through work, uh, and uh, my son was born there, actually, uh, Kirkland, uh, outside of Seattle. But uh, I found, to me, I found that the NFL was probably one or one a in terms of, of popularity in sports uh with college football college football is 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 massive i mean in seattle everybody thinks of seattle and they think of the seahawks or they think of the mariners but the university of washington huskies were the were the number one team uh you know in in seattle and i i was i was kind of amazed at that because coming coming from canada you know, professional sports are, are the thing. And, and then, you know, other things, uh, you know, junior hockey is a big thing. And, uh, but moving down to the States uh, and, and seeing how, just how massive college football is and, and high school football too. It's oh, yeah. just incredible to me anyway, as an outsider, seeing all that. And, and, uh, but the CFL, you know, in, in, in certain areas, the CFL is, is the king. You go to Saskatchewan, the team plays in Regina, Saskatchewan, and but it's not just a Regina team. People drive from all over the province, and that could be four, five, six hours, you know, to get to a game. And they'll park the day before in, in their in their RVs outside of the stadium, and they've got a special parking lot out there for that. And the Rough Riders, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, are the thing in in the province of Saskatchewan. Right. A few years ago. Here in Toronto, my son was younger then, and, and he said, Dad, can we go to the football game tonight? And I said, sure. So we hopped on the on the go train, and we, we went into Toronto and uh, got some tickets, and we ended up in a section. They were playing Saskatchewan that night. We ended up in a section. It was all Saskatchewan Rough Rider fans. And Toronto is kind of like the New York of, of, of Canada. Sure. And so everybody comes to Toronto because uh, it's the, it's the uh, cultural center. It's the uh, financial center. It's everything. And so you've got people that come to Toronto from all over Canada and all over the world, actually. Uh, but the, the Saskatchewan fans were just all over the place around us. And they were so nice. My son, my son had his Argos uh, cardboard football helmet on. And he had his blue foam finger and his Argos pennant. And every, the Argos stunk that night. But anytime they did something, my son got up and yelled and screamed and cheered. And, and all the, the Saskatchewan fans around him. He, they thought that was so cute and so funny and, and they were so nice to, to both of us. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Sports sports has a way of kind of um, bringing out some good things in people on occasion there. Well, I think especially the CFL, because when I've been to a couple of great cup games, which is, which is our Super Bowl, And uh, when you go to the festival, there's a festival that goes on basically all week. And we showed up on the Saturday, uh, the one of the game in Ottawa in 2017 and we went there to the festival area around the, around the stadium. And, you know, there are, there are players uh, from around the league, you know, you can meet them and get your picture taken with them. It's such a, it's a the access is incredible. And uh, you know, just meeting people from all over the league, the, the, the in 90 from 90, from 1993 to 1995, the CFL had a kind of an expansion ex, uh, experiment hmm. where they expanded to the United States. There were six U S cities that had CFL teams, Baltimore, Shreveport, Louisiana, San Antonio, Texas, uh, Las Vegas had a team for a short period of time. Memphis had a team and Sacramento had a team, hmm. the Sacramento gold miners. Uh, but Baltimore had a very, very strong team because they had a, an ex CFL coach and they had a lot of ex CFL players playing in that. And the, the CFL game takes a little bit of time to learn because it's a bigger field. Right. The the uh, it's especially overwhelming when American uh, defensive backs and safeties come up because there's a wider side of the field that that they have to cover mm -hmm. and and it takes them about a year and a half to kind of figure that out. Mm -hmm. uh, I I learned this from talking to a couple of guys who played in the CFL and uh, I've interviewed on on the Sports Lunatics show. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, at the Grey Cup games, there's a guy from Baltimore that comes up to the games wherever this wherever the game is held whatever city the game is held in and he's got his baltimore flag baltimore stallions flag he's got his baltimore coat this massive blue cowboy hat <laughs> and just the spirit that that exists at those games you meet people 
from all over Canada, you know, you hate their teams, they hate your teams, but you have respect for each other because we're all on the same little island. You know, we all love the CFL. Right. Do you ever uh, discuss uh, board games or uh, sports simulation with those folks on occasion? Try to get them uh, interested in. No, it's not the same. It's different up here. It's uh, because I think APA is a, is a, it's, I, I was introduced to it by my history teacher, as I said, but I don't see a lot of people up here playing it. Although on the uh, APA games and APA baseball uh, pages on Facebook, you know, you, you see the odd Canadians all over the place, uh, you know, and, and it's it's really nice to know because I've, I've made contact with them or they've made contact with me because I make envelopes for people. Right. And, uh, you know, we've we've uh, we've gotten in touch with each other and, you know, we've become friends on Facebook through that. They, it's hard because Canada is is uh, a pretty large place and okay. it's, it's not like we can drive across the street or drive down the street or down to even in the same town and, and meet somebody that plays the game. But, you know, they, there may be one like four or five towns over or something like that. And mm -hmm. so it's not as, it's not as, it's not like, it's not easy for us to get access to each other. Although we have made attempts at different times, but it's been fruitless so far. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is a pretty uh, spacious country, <laughs> beautiful country. And Toronto has a great city as well. My father actually worked there for a few years in the early 90s, lived up in, uh, uh, off of Riddell, I think it was, off the uh, uh, young loop, young Eglinton, Marley, and Riddell up that oh, really? area. Yeah, yeah so okay. kind of a... Interesting. Yeah, I find city. myself down there fairly frequently uh, these days. Nice, nice. Yeah, it's, uh, yes, folks, if you haven't been to Toronto, it is definitely, it's New York, but cleaner, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> I find it, I find it a comparable to Chicago. Hmm. Uh, Chicago, to me, reminds, reminded me very much of, of Toronto. Uh, hmm. My son and I went to Chicago, did a road trip in 2016, uh, I believe. Hmm. Uh, we saw a couple of games at Wrigley, and we saw a game on the south side as well. Drove up to Milwaukee, saw a game up there. That stadium is spectacular in Milwaukee. Oh, yeah. <laughs> unbelievable. Architecturally, just uh, unbelievable. That's yes. That's the other thing. I mean, along with all the pomp and the uh, the pageantry of sports, I mean, those are those those uh, iconic facilities, the Fenways and what have you, or just you know the Wrigleys. You know, there's just that special aura about them all. How do you, um, in your life as an Apple player, well, what sports are you playing first in Apple most most frequently? Well, I uh, baseball most frequently, but the, I, earlier this year. Uh, there was a, an app, a friend, uh, and he was selling a bunch of his old games. Mm. And I've always been kind of intrigued by the bowling game and the golf game. Mm. And he was selling the bowling game. And I asked him, you know, how much do you want? We figured out a price and uh, I bought it from him. And earlier, this, before we started talking, I was setting up my bracket for my eighth, uh, eighth PBA tournament for this year. And I, I've situated them in, in fictitious uh, TV towns. I've had one in Springfield uh, at the uh, the the whatever you know Springfield from The Simpsons, uh, South Park, um, uh, Bikini Bottom from uh, from SpongeBob, <laughs> uh, Mayberry from the Andy Griffith Show. Nice. You know the next one is going to be in Pawnee uh, from Parks and Recreation and uh, at at Rick's Ricky's Rock and Roll Bowling Alley and uh, <laughs> nice. I was just setting up the seating and setting up the brackets. So uh, yeah, that's all done now. And I'll be able to get on with it as soon as I'm able to, to get through some of the work that I have here. Right, right. Work, unfortunately, intrudes on the app experience. It's quite rude. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. It really does. So what, what do you seek to get now, you know, being in media, uh, being so close to the sport, all sports really i mean what do you kind of look to your game experience to provide is it the statistical realism kind of the what you talk about in sports lunatics the historical perspective or mix of both yeah i think it is a mix of both and i think too like for me i don't know what other people get out of it but i love generating the numbers there's something about generating all the numbers um in order for me to do my seating and I, I know you can't see it here. I'm holding up a piece of paper, but this is my bowling kind of game sheet or tournament sheet from the last tournament. Mm -hmm. And it's got every score that each guy has in each of the three uh, 
you know, bracket games. And then we go into the ladder and then it's got the uh, total pinfall, the average pinfall for the tournament, total games that he's played in all the tournaments, total pins in all the tournaments, total average, nice. uh, you know, how many points, because I give, I give everybody a point system uh, on how they do in their, in each tournament and then points that tournament points after at this, at this point it was six tournaments and then total points. And that's how I do my rankings by total points. And then if there's ties in points, then I go by average. Hmm. But to me, it's just that, you know, generating the, the, uh, the numbers getting through to the, to the final, final, final moments. And my baseball, since I got back into baseball in 2013 with the 2012 season, mm. I've played, I've done replays and I've got, a. it's kind of a champion's chronicle where I put all, all the champions and I was playing two seasons or two, yeah, two seasons replays each year. And uh, so, you know, you, it gets down to, uh, you know, the final two and the final four, final two, and then the final, the final champion. Uh, and I guess, since I got back into it in 2013, uh, through the Facebook pages, I've managed to amass a lot of different baseball seasons. And so mm. I, I play, I, I, as I say, I've been playing two seasons a year because, I mean, Lord knows how many years I've got left here. So I want to get as many in as I can mm. and, and, and experience as many of the, of the different seasons as I can. But it's, it's part of the history, you're right, part of the numbers seeing some of the cards from some of these great, great players, you know, from the past and some of the guys too. And I, I'm, I'm just going off the top of my head, but there's always one or two that come out of nowhere, you know, that you didn't really see coming like Dave Revering for the Oakland A's had an amazing card. I'm sure he didn't play a lot of games, but right. he had a pretty amazing card back. I think it was in 72, 73 or 74, one of the world series seasons. Or maybe it was 78. I'm not sure. Anyway, it was one of those, you know, just guys like that that just come out of nowhere. Right. And I'm seeing that too with uh, with the bowling now. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm playing the 1978 PBA tournament right. season. And uh, Mark Roth right now is, is the number one bowler. Bill Spigner is number two. Number three is Earl Anthony, the great Earl Anthony. Yeah. Number four is Joe Berardi. He's the only guy in the top... 10 that hasn't or top well, i guess it's top whatever that hasn't won a tournament yet but number five is where's number five anyway it doesn't matter it's it's you know it's guys guys like that the, when we were kids my brother and i on saturday afternoons we'd sit and on rainy days we'd watch bowling yep. and we just loved it and then we'd set up the plastic pins in the hallway and we'd bowl you know with uh, you know, and probably drive my mother crazy with, you know, <laughs> it, just and seeing all those names again and all those guys. It's just it, it brings back all those memories of, of, you know, what we used to do as kids and and uh -huh. watching or playing with the baseball, you know, going back to the 70s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. It, it just takes me back to to watching those games on TV and and seeing those guys that I used to watch play and, and love and, 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 you know, just. Uh, you know, seeing Henry Aaron's card from 1974, the year that he broke the record, you know, mm. he was, he was getting up there in age, but he still had an amazing card, you know, just, and that's, those are the things that I love about the game. Do you have, now that you've been back into collecting any sets that have become favorites or sets that you have your, your eyes on acquiring? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, uh, but I think right now I, I, I just, I moved in November uh, into a, a different house and I'm still, I still have boxes like that I haven't unpacked yet. Sure. Uh, but so right now my, my priority besides my regular day job and then, you know, doing, doing the uh, podcast, the, the sports lunatics show and, and then doing my writing and uh, you know, making envelopes for people. It doesn't leave me a lot of other time for, for anything right now. Mm -hmm. But my favorite sets, I think, are the original sets that I have from 63, 64, 65, 66. That 63 set, there's a different finish on the cards, and it just, they're all in plastic. Uh, I, I'm afraid to use them <laughs> because I don't want to soil them, you know, but they're just so beautiful, and I just love them. That's that is one of the things, yeah. Especially when you go to the uh, the APA convention, there's a lot of cards 
a lot of cards uh, flying around and a lot of, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, don't, don't uh, damage it. And you see those ones, God forbid, where people write on them, those really old sets and things, you know? Yes, like, yes, yes. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that I have, I, 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 you know, yeah, people write on them because we, we, we do a lot of trading or not trading, but, you know, buying and selling in, in the, uh, in the Facebook pages right. and on eBay as well. I've kind of gotten off eBay though, because eBay is just, I, I don't know, it's, there's something about it that just, it doesn't feel right anymore for me. But uh, when I get the cards, you know, from buying from secondhand and all that stuff, and you see the writing in, in ink on the cards, it's like, ah, at least if it's in pencil, you can try to, to get it off without d damaging the cards too much. But if it's in ink, it's kind of like, ah, uh. <laughs> you get a, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You, you mentioned that about eBay. I mean, when we started our page about 10 years ago, uh, you know, the auctions were, and there were a lot of auctions. We built our, you know, the, our collection for archival purposes and, you know, talking about the different sets. And there were a couple of really hardcore collectors and the prices would go up, but there were still some bargains. It feels like now there's a really, the price level has jumped up considerably, the baseline price levels. It really has. And of yeah. course, too, the other thing for, for me living in Canada, the price of shipping and handling to get stuff from the States up to here is astronomical now. Mm. And so that's kind of turned me off it as well. So, so uh, we're telling uh, Mr. Hurston to get a Canadian distribution center, I think, on the uh, Canadian. Oh, that would be wonderful. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Yeah, or even yeah, some kind of some kind of thing in Buffalo or something. Maybe we yeah. could just drive to the border and pick it up there or something. There you go. There you go. Um, so you've you've mentioned your custom envelopes a couple times here, and so we want to get to that for sure. Um, you know, if you've checked him out, uh, his work out on Facebook, uh, uh, Howie, Chris, Chris White also does some envelopes. I mean, is what, how, how many envelopes have you generated? How many sets have you generated? Oh, I, I it's been a few years now. It'd be in, impossible for me to, to try and even think of that, but wow. uh, I love the work Chris does. Chris does, Chris does things in a different style. I think Chris does uh, his style is is a little more I, I guess it's a little more uh, loud a little more like he he we both look at the envelope as a canvas I guess he looks he likes to cover the whole canvas I I like I'm a little more uh, conservative in my in my uh, style I think uh, my original thought when when I was started doing them was you know the original envelopes that we used to get with the uh, with the teams. They mm -hmm. just had the name of the team and the name of the league. Right. And I just wanted to put the logo in the middle. And that was how I first started. Actually, the, the first time I made an envelope, it was probably in the 70s when I wore out, I wore out my 1972 cards. Wow. I didn't wear out the cards, but I wore out the envelopes because I was playing it all the always time. Always opening and yeah. <laughs> and the Detroit Tigers envelope, they were always going to the World Series. So they were always making it, uh, you know, the envelope was getting worn out. It got, it got destroyed. Hmm. in my use so I, I i made an envelope i basically took the old detroit envelope and i folded unfolded it and put it on a piece of paper and i traced it out with a pen on on a, on on, a, on the table and i used a piece of loose leaf paper basically and i folded them all up and folded the, the, the flaps and, and made the that was my first envelope and i wrote detroit tigers on it american league just like the except it was on a white paper with blue lines on it and uh, that was the first envelope I ever made. That was back, you know, when I was like 16 years old or something. But I, I never even thought of it again until my son started going through all my old cards, all mm. my extra cards. And he wanted to make his own teams. And he thought, is this guy a good dad? Is this guy a good dad? Is this guy a good dad? And he, he ended up taking them because he was living at my ex-wife's place at the time. Now he's up in school. But uh, you know, so he, he took a whole bunch of my cards and I, I hate seeing loose cards. So I made him some envelopes and they were very rudimentary, very, very basic. Uh, just not good. I didn't like them. Oh, I don't like them now, but anyway, uh, you know, you live, you, you make trial and error. Everything's trial and error. You, you know, you learn by your mistakes. And I told my son that a million times, you know, you, you learn more from your failures and your losses than you do from your successes and your victories. But anyway, uh, you know, so from that then i started making more and more envelopes and uh, and i think it's probably been about five six years now that i've been making them for other people 
uh, I started, I just started posting the pictures of the envelopes that I made for myself mm-hmm. on, on Facebook, on the, on the Facebook page. And uh, people liked them and they said, how can I get some of those? And then we started talking and that's how I started making them for people. Nice. Nice. Yeah, it really is great work. And, and I, I de- definitely see the differences in your work and Chris's. Chris has got like, if he puts all the baseball uh, envelopes together, he's got the seams on the. Yes, yes. Like, he does spect- they're spectacular work. I, I, I just, I really, part of me really envies the work that he does because it's so beautiful and it's so spectacular. It's just, it's such a different style from, from what I, from what I would do, but it's just, I, I admire it anyway. You know, it's, yeah. it's just wonderful. Well, it's great that you're both so prolific at it, for sure. And it, and it kind of speaks to the ability to kind of put yourself in your own spin on the game, kind of really uh, customize a bit. Um, in terms of, I was just thinking, in terms of uh, your playing style, you, you mentioned that it's kind of hard to connect with people. So I imagine you're doing uh, more solitaire than anything. But I just wonder if you have kind of a certain uh, style in terms of uh, setting lineups, if you go for you know, extreme historic accuracy, if you do some of the what if kind of things, uh, if you had any usage rules for some of those, you know, out of nowhere power cards, because that's a big thing in the football world. It's like, well, this guy had this one massive, you know, touchdown. He's got ones all over the place, but you can't, you know, it's not fair to use yeah, he that. He had three time. carries and one, one touchdown or something, right? Right. You know, it's, and it's, it's kind of ridiculous. No, I remember when we, the first tournament I played in was the Chicago world series in, or the Chicago Land World Series in nine, in 2016. Hmm. That was the first actual tournament that I went to. And my son came with me and we both played in it. It was so much fun. But there were kind of little ground rules in there. You know, you couldn't use a J4. Uh, you couldn't start a J4. You could bring him in as a pinch hitter, but you couldn't you couldn't start him. Because some of the J4s, you know, they, they, they have such an unbelievable cards because they've had so few at-bats and so few games played. That, that their cards would be unfair if they played a regular role. So that's the kind of thing I try to go by that. Mm-hmm. But in terms of my replays, I try to, I try to maximize the, 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 uh, the potential for each team if I can. And I mean, I'm a massive Montreal Expos fan. I love the Expos. Uh, when I, I was nine years old, when they came into existence in 1969. Mm-hmm. And to me, I mean, they were my favorite team. Now it's really hard sometimes when the Expos are, are, are crap, <laughs> you know, they're, they're not doing very well at all. And so, yeah, but you have to play with, with that in mind. I mean, uh, they have a lot of grade D pitchers in the early years, even Mike Marshall, who was the ACE uh, closer of the staff in 72, but by that time he was a grade A and C, but in earlier years, he was a grade D and, you know, the, 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 when you've got a bullpen that's all grade D pitchers, you have to use them. You can't, you know, if the starter is not doing well, you have to take him out and you have to put in these other grade, these grade D pitchers, you know, but personally, I try to, if there's a, there's little rules in the, uh, in the game where if you put a, a relief pitcher in, in the middle of an inning, the first pitcher he faces, his grade is up one. So if he's a D, he starts as a C. Then after that, he becomes a D again, you know, little things, I try to be, I try to be as realistic in my use of catchers, you know, because a catcher that one catcher can't play every game. It's just not, it's not feasible. You know, he would, he would wear out if it happened in a real season. So you have to platoon your catchers and, you know, other positions you platoon guys as well. And uh, I play basic, so I don't have the left versus right kind of uh, issue to deal with, but I try to get guys, I try to get everybody in to as many games as, as, as would be, normal or as would be beneficial to the team and to get everybody in to get stats for everybody as well. I, I, I don't, I, I mean, I don't really have specific rules about the, the things through the game. Like some people will, will do certain things, but I'll follow the, the advanced basic. That's I guess if, if I can say it that way, mm-hmm. uh, where, you know, pitchers grades can, can, in, can improve if they're having a really good game uh, you know, but they can decrease as well if the guy is having a bad game, you know, those kind of things. I, I do the individual fielding, uh, you know, if, if the shortstop is an eight or a nine, or if he's a nine or a 10, he's a fielding one. If he's an eight, he's a fielding two. If he's a seven, he's a fielding three, uh, that, that kind of thing, as opposed to the collective team fielding, 
because you can have a, a team that's a bad fielding team overall, but you can have one guy who's an excellent fielder and it, and it, it penalizes him, you know, because, and it shouldn't penalize him. It should be more difficult for the hitters to hit to that, that player than it would be to the other players who are not so good fielders. If that makes sense. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, how do you do your prep? Are there any? I mean, obviously, yeah, again, you know, in in the uh, in in your profession, as, as we as journalists, uh, you know, we really are, you know, close to research materials. I wonder if there's any particular uh, set of resources that you found most helpful uh, for your game prep, your replay prep. Baseballreference.com. Yeah. Baseballreference.com uh, to me is is just the greatest i have some baseball encyclopedias as well that i keep in my shelf that's next to my desk when i'm playing uh but most of those are from earlier years and i find the print now at my age is getting a little small you know to to uh, to read but uh, baseballreference.com there's so much in there and you can go and you can see individual games i i did a piece uh because the toronto maple leafs lost so spectacularly this past week to the Montreal Canadiens. Mm. I did a piece on why, why, not only why we should have empathy for Toronto Maple Leafs fans, I'm a Montreal Canadiens fan, by the way, but why we should have empathy for Toronto Maple Leafs fans because their team, they've been in a long-term relationship with a team that hasn't held up their end of the bargain. But then I went through great Toronto sports collapses of the, of the, uh, you know, of the past. And to me, before this, this collapse, they, the Leafs had a 3-1 lead in, in the series. Game four, they had a four nothing shutout. They looked dominant. And then Montreal won games five, six, and seven to take the series. But before that, the biggest collapse, I think, was the 1987 Blue Jays season. They had a three and a half game lead with seven games remaining over Detroit in the American League East. They did not win another game out of those last seven. Mm. Detroit uh, passed them. And to me, that was the biggest Toronto sports collapse until this Leafs thing. Mm -hmm. And so for, to, in order to write that column, I had to go through baseball reference and I went game by game in that, in that last seven days mm -hmm. to see what happened and, and uh, to, to try to understand how the Jays could have just lost it so, so quickly, so precipitously, so intensely, and so you know, immediately the way they did. Uh, the other one I looked at was uh, the 85 American League Championship Series. The Toronto Blue Jays had a 3-1 lead against Kansas City in that mm -hmm. series. And then the Royals came back to win games 5, 6, and 7, went on to the World, the World Series against the Cardinals and, uh, and won and uh, just, uh, you know, went through each game again, you know, and, and, and you're allowed, you, you know, baseball reference allows you to do that. They have not only do they have each box score from each game, but they have key moments in each game, you know, so you can go through and you can, oh my God, I remember that Jim Sunberg triple, how he hit that ball off the right field fence, you know, and, and it rattled around excruciation stadium. I mean, exhibition stadium, uh, you know, uh, it just, uh, uh, just the heartbreak of that series. It, it came back to me viscerally. And I, I just, you know, I felt that pain in my stomach again. Mm. Mm. what uh what uh what's your favorite sports movie whoa favorite sports movie ah that's a good question uh last year on the sports lunatics my co-host sean levine and i we did a show on our favorite sports movies and one i really really loved was i think it was uh dennis quaid was a football player was it uh it wasn't it was that championship season or something like that jessica lang was his was his wife and it, it, it chronicles his time from being a star running back at lsu to his time uh playing in the nfl uh at, and uh he played with washington if i'm i'm trying to remember now but i loved i just loved the movie i love the story arc the way it all went john goodman played with him at lsu he was, uh, you know, and they played, it started, I guess, in the 50s because they were playing both ways. Uh, both guys were playing both ways on, on that, uh, you know, both sides, the offense and defense. And uh, so, but just, you know, you see how it went from, from college through to the pros, through to his, the last year of his career when he played with Denver. 
and he wore number 41 and he was, his name was Gavin Gray and he was the gray ghost. And the, what, what I, I'm a bad, I'm a bad movie watcher because I look for the, uh, the, the continuity errors in movies right. and he's wearing 41 and it shows him jumping over the line. And then in the, in the, uh, you see him coming down the other side and it's Jim Lytle, you know, coming down on the other side and it's, you can see Lytle on his back. <laughs> and I, that, that's, I see, I'm so bad because I, I shouldn't be, I should be enjoying the movie instead of looking for the continuity errors, but the story arc, I really enjoyed the story arc. And I, I enjoyed seeing him at in retirement, how he'd become miserable, you know, and I'm sure this happens to a lot of athletes after they finish playing, because you can never recreate the excitement that you feel when you are, when you are playing and, and the people love you and all this, and you know, every, everything is going so well. And then, you know, it stops and you don't have that money coming in and you don't have the adulation coming in and it, it, it becomes a total different thing. And, and it's just, it, it, to me, that movie was just, it's one of my favorites. I, I can't say it's my 100% one absolute favorite. I loved uh, Hoosiers. That was an, an amazing movie. Uh, just, you know, so many different ones. And I, 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 we were talking yesterday, I was, I was golfing yesterday and, uh, and we were talking about uh, Waterboy with Adam Sandler, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's a stupid movie, but it's fun. You know, it's just uh, all that. It's, it's so many great, there's so many good stuff, so much good stuff out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, just, uh, but that's, that, those are a couple of them right there. Nice. Nice. Now you mentioned, you'd mentioned that you were acquiring uh, golf, I think, uh, Apple golf as well. How well, would you, it's, it's one of the ones I covered. I haven't got it yet. You haven't but, got it. Okay. And, and I, as I say, looking at eBay and looking at the prices of golf on eBay, now the older golf games, yeah. they're through the roof. And so I'll bide my time and, and, and see what happens. Something will come up. I'm sure. Maybe work a trade or something. Yeah. Maybe, that, yeah. You know, there needs to be maybe a loaner program. That, <laughs> yeah, a trial program. It's like here, you know, lo- check out the game and you know, check it back in or something like that. <laughs> Would you uh you you talked about your son uh in, in terms of uh you know your your the development of your envelope work. I just wonder is is he uh do you think he'll stick with the habit? Do you think uh there are opportunities to bring those younger sports fans into the uh, board game fold? I would love to see that. I would love to see the game marketed to, to kids uh, the way it was to us when we were kids. Um, but I mean, I remember seeing the ads on the backs of comic books and I don't know how many people read comic books anymore. Uh, there, there have to be ways to get the, the message because the games are so wonderful. And they, you know, the, we get so much enjoyment out of the games. There has to be a way to, to, to channel that directly because I know you know, I, I think you saw my post la- last night. You know, I said I'm doing it. I'm, I'm going to be interviewed tomorrow uh, on a YouTube show. And I said that the, uh, the, the media landscape that I grew up with is so different today from the media landscape that my son experiences. And the way that the kids today, and I, I, sound, I sound so old when I say that, don't I? <laughs> uh, the way that people my son's generation um, consume anything sports music everything it's so different from the way that we did there has to be a way though to channel the the the, the wonderful uh feeling that we get from the games through to them in their in their media you know the, there has to be a way to do that and, and i would love to see it i mm-hmm. I, I i i'm, I'm concerned obviously because the, the people that are playing it, the majority of the people that I see playing the games on, on the Facebook pages are all my age and, 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 you know, your age. And, but you know, too, the thing too, the average age of sports viewers, the average age of, of football viewers, of, of baseball viewers, it's in the fifties, hmm. you know? Hmm. So you see now NFL games, I think on Thursday nights this year are going to be broadcast on Amazon. Which to me, it just blows my mind. It's it's. I mean, yeah, it's 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 shaking out uh, the media landscape. Shakes out uh, a lot of different ways, which is good and bad, I guess. I mean, it's great for the consumer who can kind of follow it around. I mean, they're they're kind of meeting you. The leagues are meeting people where they are. I think that's probably kind of a big hint. You know, meet them where they 
congregate. Uh, you know, I, I was just looking at uh, NashCon 2021 as a big gaming conference. It's going to be coming back up. Uh, I think they used to have one in Lancaster, which is, of course, Apple's hometown. Um, there's the complete strategist here in New York City on 33rd still. I mean, there's a ton of uh, board game players and a lot of uh, stats geeks, you know, for a lot of lack of a you know better word. I mean, we, you know, there are folks, and particularly during the pandemic, I mean, obviously that's that's accelerated anything from uh, you know any stay-at-home activity you know but you, if you look at on instagram I, you know where i was reading your profile if you look at the board gaming sites there they skew very young you know yeah. 20 so i mean it's kind of getting into that landscape and and perhaps you know but but that that brings up the other question too do you have to be a fan of the sport how much does that count for your appa enjoyment that's a good question and that's not really one that i ever pondered before because i was all, always a huge sports fan uh the first time i went to a canadian football league game i was nine years old my my uncle was a columnist for the ottawa citizen and he had two tickets and my cousin said you want to come with me and went to the game you know we got on the bus and we went to the game and and sat there and the colors and everything was so bright it was a beautiful day the, the sounds you know those plastic air horns everybody had them back then yeah. You could smoke in there. The cigar smoke was just wafting through the everything. And, and the programs, my goodness, the programs were like oh. this treasure, you know, and everything was just so, it just felt so wonderful. And I, I loved it right from the first second I was there. And, uh, you know, I was hooked on sports right away. Now, you know, we we weren't the the, the most well-to-do family so we couldn't get into playing a lot of sports until a little later but uh you know i just loved i loved going to the games and i loved you know i thought that the people that had season tickets at those games must be the richest people in the world you know and <laughs> my grandfather had season tickets on the north side stands my uncle uh, had season tickets on the south side stands and i thought oh that must be the most wonderful thing to be able to go to those football games there you know 10 games a year you know exhibition games and and, and, and regular season games, that must be the most wonderful thing in the world. And then there was a program, one of the uh, RBC, the Royal Bank of Canada, had a little program uh, when I was 12 years old, I think, when where if you opened up an account with them for $5, you could get, uh, if you were a certain age, you know, you could get season tickets in the end zone. And so my brother and I, we got our paper route money together and we got season tickets in the end zone. And we thought we're the Kings, you know, we're the greatest people in the world because we're <laughs> sitting here. We, we, we have, the seats are terrible, but we have, you know, we're here, you know, we're here, we're in the, we're in the park. And, and uh, uh, that was, that was just wonderful. And, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it, that's, that's just my own recollection. I, I hope that meant something. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned going back to the Chicagoland tournament. I just wonder how uh, do you maintain relationships now with those folks? Any chance you might get down to Atlanta for the conference convention, the annual or? Well, right now it's going to be hard here because we're still basically in lockdown. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm able to do a lot of stuff from home, which is wonderful, but we're still in lockdown here. Uh, we don't, we haven't had the access to a lot of the vaccines the way that, the way that uh, you guys have, uh, the way that everything's been rolled out there. But, uh, you know, it's coming. It's all coming. And hopefully, hopefully, touch wood as I tap the top of my head, uh, you know, we can we can start traveling again uh, sometime in 2021. I'm, I'm hoping that we can. Um, I, I have maintained relationships with a lot of the guys that I met in Chicago. It's, and, uh, you know, it's, it's been fantastic because everybody's such a, everybody's so great you know they're all such great people and uh, you know you know they all come from different different uh, walks of life and different places and it meeting the people there we were the only canadians there but meeting people from california and and people that came from Ken, kentucky and 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 just different places all over you know all over the united states it was it was spectacular it was wonderful we went to uh 2017 we went to uh, ken schultz and his brother have the uh, Linda B. Schultz tournament in uh, outside of Pittsburgh in Slippery Rock. And that was amazing too. That was just wonderful. Uh, you know, the people that were there, different people from the Chicago one, but you know, a lot of, the, some of the same people and just same thing, come from all over the place to, to congregate in this, in this little venue. 
and, uh, and celebrate the game that we all love. And, uh, you know, people were so good to my son, you know, people gave him, gave him card sets and, you know, it's like unbelievable, just the generosity and the, and just the warmth that everybody shared at those tournaments. Yeah. We have definitely uh, kept in touch. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, this has been a fantastic conversation. I, I wanted to just any parting thoughts from you in terms of kind of the importance of sports simulation games, APA, and even other ones on kind of your development you know, as a person, as your kind of, uh, uh, you know, as an experience, as an outlet, as, uh, you know, whatever it means to folks. When I, well, as I say, when I started playing, I was 13 years old. Uh, I, I knew a little bit about baseball. I played Little League Baseball and I'd watch the games on TV. But I think playing the games gives you a knowledge, more of an intimate knowledge of each player's uh, potential or capabilities, if that makes sense. And you, you learn the game, you get to know the game more completely than you do if you just watch the games on TV. And I, I think that that part, that part of it allowed me to learn games and allowed me to become, um, you know, a, a little bit more of a, like a coach later on in baseball, uh, learning how to use people, putting, putting a lineup together. Uh, you know, put people in certain situations where they can succeed as, as much as possible. Uh, I think that's what the, the, the games did for me. I think that they, uh, they, they gave me more of a complete knowledge of the game of both baseball and football, because I got the football game in 1979 or, you know, and I played that, I, I played that for a while. And as I said, got into college and then, and then my, my interests went somewhere else, but uh, you know, I think both, they, they gave me a better knowledge of the game and, and how, how to, just how to, all of the little inside things about the game. Uh, it, it made my knowledge better. It made my knowledge more complete. Excellent. Excellent. Howie, thanks so much. Uh, it's been a, a real pleasure here, and I hope uh, we have some future discussions here, particularly uh, happy hunting. I hope your collection can grow here, and hopefully you can get back out to, to the, uh, the uh, tournaments here. Well, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate being on with you. It's, it's been fun. Awesome. Awesome. Take care. You too. All righty.